everyone and welcome to Miss Estric Biology. In this video, it's an updated version of my nephron video going through all the information you need to know about how the nephron filters the blood. So let's get into it. So what we'll cover in this video is the structure of the nephron, function of the renal capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts. We'll go through how ultrafiltration occurs and where it happens and what selective reabsorption is and again where it happens. So starting off then just with an overview of the kidney, you don't actually need to know the structures in detail. All you need to know is that the filtering and osmoregulation, which will be in a later video, occur in the nephrons. The nephrons are found within the medulla, which is just here. So the nephrons then, what they actually are, is these long tubules, which are surrounded by capillaries. And you have about one million nephrons in each of your kidneys. So the structure of the nephron, just zooming in on one here, you have, as we said, the capillaries surrounding them. And leading into the nephron, you have an afferent arterial which then branches into lots and lots of smaller capillaries. And that is what we call the glomerulus. So that there is lots of capillaries, the glomerulus. Now those lie inside of this capsule, which is called the renal capsule, sometimes called the Bowman's capsule, or on this picture here, the glomerular capsule. But the AQA spec calls it the renal capsule, so that's what I'll be using. After that, it then leads into the proximal convoluted tubule, which we can see winding around here, into the loop of Henle, then up to the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. So we'll go through what happens at each of these positions in the nephron to create urine. So that's the overall function of the nephron is to create urine um, and that is because you're filtering the blood to remove waste. So any excess water, urea is going to be removed. Useful substances will be selectively reabsorbed back into the blood. So the urine will only contain water, excess water, dissolved salts or mineral ions, urea and any other small substances that um, can be filtered out, so it could be hormones or excess vitamins. In a healthy person, you should never find proteins, blood cells or glucose. And this is actually from GCSE as well, the knowledge of knowing why you would never find a protein or a blood cell in urine and why you'd never find glucose. So just as a reminder, the proteins and blood cells are both too big to be filtered out, so they'll always remain in the blood. Glucose does get filtered out, but all of the glucose is reabsorbed by active transport in the selective reabsorption stage, which occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule, or PCT for short. Sure. So an overview, first of all, of all of this filtering and reabsorption. Step one is in the glomerulus, you have this ultrafiltration of water and small molecules due to high pressure and that will force out the small molecules and water into the renal capsule. Then you'll have your filtrate, which is called the glomerulus filtrate, passing into the proximal convoluted tubule. And at this stage, 85% of that filtrate gets reabsorbed back into the blood. The loop of Henle is the next stage. And at this point, the sodium ion gradient is maintained and that is to enable water to be reabsorbed by osmosis into the blood. And then the final step, we've got our distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct where further water is removed by osmosis or diffuses out by osmosis and is reabsorbed back into the blood. And any of the remaining liquid in the collecting duct goes on to form urine. So let's go through each of these stages then in detail. Starting with the ultrafiltration. So at this point, we have blood entering through the afferent arterial and the arterial splits into lots and lots of smaller capillaries. And as we said at the start, that is what the glomerulus is. Because you've gone from a wider lumen or a larger space into lots of smaller, narrower capillaries, you end up creating this hydrostatic pressure. So that high pressure 
forces out small molecules and water and it has to be small because it has to be small enough to be able to fit through the tiny gaps in the cells in the epithelium of the capillaries. That forms the glomerulus filtrate. So we call it glomerulus filtrate because it's formed from the glomerulus. Staying in the blood, you'll have large proteins and blood cells because they're too big to fit out of the gaps. So they will then pass out of the efferent arterial and continue to circulate around the blood in the body. So just to show you where that is happening, we've got zoomed in here. We can see our afferent arterial splitting to make the glomerulus and then leaving, we have the efferent arterial. So the ultrafiltration will be occurring here and the glomerulus filtrate will be going into this renal capsule. So just here. So I'm going to go through in a bit more detail here how that filtration happens. So we've talked about how the high hydrostatic pressure is generated. And now we're going to zoom in on the capillaries. So this is a capillary within that glomerulus. And the capillaries have just a single layer of cells making up their endothelium. So that's what these structures here are representing. Really, really zoomed in, looking at those cells making up the endothelium. And there are tiny gaps between those cells. That is your first place where the filtration happens. So a bit like a sieve, anything that's small enough to fit through those gaps will pass through. Then you have a basement membrane, which again acts as a filter. And then finally, on the outside, you have podocytes, which are these cells that wrap around the capillary. And there are tiny gaps between those as well, which adds another filtration layer. So here are the podocytes we can see on the outside of the capillaries wrapping around those. And looking at it from a different angle, those are the podocytes and there's tiny gaps again. So you've essentially got three filtrations. We've got the gaps between the endothelium of the capillary, basement membrane, and then the gaps between the podocytes. So that's the ultrafiltration. So that glomerulus filtrate is now going to flow and pass into the proximal convoluted tubule. And this is where selective reabsorption happens. So 85% of that filtrate that's just been created gets reabsorbed back into the blood um, at this stage in the proximal convoluted tubule. So we're going to go through how that happens. Before we do that, I'm just going to point out some adaptations of the cells lining the proximal convoluted tubule. And that's what we're looking at here. So this bit is the lumen. So that is the space in the middle that the filtrate passes through. This bit, proximal convoluted tubule cells. So those are the epithelial cells. We then got a slight gap, which we call the interstitial space, which is the gap between the proximal convoluted tubule and the capillaries that surround it. And then here we have our capillary. So the two key adaptations are the proximal convoluted tubule cells have all of these microvilli, and that creates a really large surface area to maximize the reabsorption of glucose. There's also lots of mitochondria within these cells, and that's because energy is needed for active transport at this stage. So those are our adaptations. What we need to look at next then is how selective reabsorption happens. So step one, the concentration of sodium ions in the proximal convoluted tubule, which I've just abbreviated to PCT, um, is low within that cell. That is low because sodium ions are actively transported out of the PCT into the bloodstream. So that is why we have all these mitochondria to provide energy for the active transport of sodium ions out of the proximal convoluted tubule cells into the blood. The impact that has is the cell here has um, a very, very low concentration of sodium ions compared to the glomerulus filtrate, which is going to be flowing through the lumen. So that then means that the sodium ions can move into the proximal convoluted tubule by diffusion, going down their concentration gradient. Now, the protein that the sodium ions diffuse through is a co-transporter protein. And that particular protein, both sodium ions and glucose attach to. So when that sodium ion attaches 
so does glucose and therefore that is how glucose gets from the glomerulus filtrate into the proximal convoluted tubule. So the final step is you'll now have a large concentration of glucose within your proximal convoluted tubule cell. And because you've got that high concentration compared to in the blood, you have a concentration gradient. So the glucose can diffuse from the PCT cell into the bloodstream. And that is how all of the glucose is reabsorbed that was initially um, filtered out. Now, one thing I just want to emphasize is reabsorbed. If you just say absorb, that is incorrect because absorb means it's the first time it was taken in. This is reabsorption because it was already in the blood, then it was filtered out, but then we take it back into the blood. So whenever you are talking about the kidneys, you will only ever be using the term reabsorb. So next then, the filtrate would have passed through the PCT and now it's leading into the loop of Henle. And at this stage, the function of the loop of Henle is to maintain a sodium ion gradient. So that's what we're going to have a look at. But first of all, just to see the structure in more detail. So the loop of Henle, we describe as being made up of two limbs. So we have an ascending limb and a descending limb. And this is named after the direction that the filtrate is moving in. So, so to go through the stages then of what's happening at the loop of Henle. Step one. There are mitochondria within the walls of the ascending limb, and that's to provide energy for the active transport of sodium ions. So sodium ions are actively transported out of the filtrate into what we call the interstitial space, which is the space between the nephron and the capillaries. In doing this, there's an accumulation of sodium ions in this interstitial space in the medulla, and it creates a really low water potential. Now the numbers that you can see here in the loop of Henle and in the interstitial space, that is representing water concentration. So we're having um, a lower water concentration here, we've got more sodium ions moving in, so we have a more concentrated solution or a lower water potential. Because there's a lower water potential, that means the water in the descending limb of the loop of Henle will move out by osmosis into the interstitial space and then it'll be reabsorbed into the blood. So that's how the water is reabsorbed into the blood. Final thing to point out on the loop of Henle is step four down here and it's at the very, very base of the ascending limb. Because there's now very dilute um, solution or very low concentration of sodium ions at the base, some of the sodium ions will move out by diffusion. So the next step in our nephron, we've gone through the renal capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, next is the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts. Next then is the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. And one thing just to point out, although I've used PCT and DCT at different points in this video, in the exam you do have to write out those full terms. So proximal convoluted tubule and now the distal convoluted tubule. So due to all the sodium ions that have been actively transported out of the ascending loop of Henle, by the time the filtrate gets to the top, so at the distal convoluted tubule, you actually have a very dilute filtrate that is remaining inside the tubule, especially in comparison to the water potential of the medulla. So as that filtrate moves into the distal convoluted tubule and then the collecting ducts, you have that concentrated solution or very negative water potential. And that is what causes even more water to move out by osmosis from the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. And whatever filtrate remains in the collecting duct goes on to form the urine. So that is the whole process of ultrafiltration and reabsorption and how urine is created. An example of an application question that comes up to do with the loop of Henle is the one we've got here. So in the past, students have been asked to suggest how the length of the loop of Henle will differ for a desert animal compared to a human. And then you'd be asked to explain why. So he said the loop of Henle, the function is to maintain the sodium ion concentration gradients so that more water can be 
reabsorbed. So if they're in the desert, they're going to need more water to be reabsorbed and therefore they'll have a longer loop of Henle so that more sodium ions can be um, actively transported out and therefore more water will be reabsorbed. So if you've got this longer loop of Henle, there's a larger surface area for sodium ions to be actively transported out. So you'll then have even more sodium ions lowering the water potential. More water will move out by osmosis. And that gets reabsorbed into the blood. And as a result, they get more water going back into the blood and very, very concentrated urine which for a desert animal, that's essential for survival because their environment has very little water. So whatever water they do get from their food or from their water, it's essential that that gets reabsorbed back into the blood rather than lost and wasted in the urine. So just to summarise then, the nephron is made up of the renal capsule, the PCT, loop of Henle, DCT and collecting ducts, and they're surrounded by capillaries. The glomerular filtrate is created in the renal capsule. Glucose and water are reabsorbed back into the blood by the PCT. The sodium ion gradient is maintained in the loop of Henle and that's to enable water reabsorption. And then further reabsorption happens in the DCT and the collecting ducts. So that is it for filtering and reabsorption in the nephron. Make sure to watch the next video on osmoregulation so you can see the negative feedback and homeostasis of how the permeability of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct changes um, depending on how much water you have in your blood. If you want to have a go at some practice questions to test your knowledge, head over to Miss Estrick. And if you aren't already subscribed, make sure you click the button to subscribe and give it a thumbs up if you have found this video helpful.